Hey everyone, welcome back. Um, up next, we have Stefan Uwen, and he's going to talk about uh, stream processing and event-driven databases with stateful functions. Uh, again, bring your questions to the studio channel on Slack, and we'll ask them at the very end of the session. Stefan? Thanks, Josh. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Stephen. I'm very happy to be here again at, at Berlin Buzzwords in the like in the virtual edition um, this year. Um, yeah, I'll be talking about um, about stateful functions and about yeah, it's uh, it's work we're doing in the um, Apache Flink project. It's a it's a, a way how we think about the evolution of um, stream processing towards towards something that you know we we started calling um, an, an event-driven database. And yeah, I'm excited to be here today to tell the story. So before before jumping in, just uh, one slide with uh, maybe background about um, myself and the company I work for. Um, we're um, we're Viverica. We're the um, company formerly co uh, known as Data Artisans. Um, we're founded by the by the original creators of um, of Apache Flink, and that's what we're doing still day to day most of the time, developing um, open source stream processing technology in the Apache Flink project. Um, we're also offering an enterprise stream processing platform, and um, yeah, the company started as Data Artisans. It's now called Viverica. That's because a little more than half a year ago, it was actually acquired by, uh, acquired by the Alibaba Group. So it's part of the Alibaba Group ecosystem right now. And um, yeah, we rebranded as as part of that. Okay, jumping into the um, jumping into the, uh, the the main the main talk here. Um, uh, the 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 original title is is a bit of a mouthful, like uh, stream processors and event-driven databases, or from stream processor to event-driven database with stateful functions. Um, I thought maybe an, another title like I could have picked that was a bit a bit shorter, but might also describe pretty well what we're trying to do here is um, the quest for stateful serverless. So stateful serverless, what what is that supposed to be? So Serverless is is this big trend happening in, in computing these days, right? I mean, some people associate it with things like Amazon Lambda, but it's, it's really this much broader trend to yeah to not be thinking about physical um, instances of hardware and software and so on. And um, serverless has made a pretty good headway when it comes to um, to to be able to handle um, stateless applications. But handling stateful applications in a serverless way is still still somewhat of a still a challenge. And um, yeah, part of what we've been doing in the Stateful Functions project is trying to look and answer for how to how to simplify this. And um, I think I'm going to open this talk with a bit of a of a daring thesis. So um, the like the hypothesis of this uh, Stateful Function project is that stream processors are going to be in the future to event-driven serverless application. What the the databases, the be that SQL databases or the key value stores are to the CRUD application um, today. And um, yeah, I hope I can back up this thesis and, and uh, get you, get uh, get the audience here excited about um, wh what that means and why why this is actually a really interesting um, avenue to pursue, and in, uh, in the way we're building we're building applications. So let's actually dive in. Let's let's dive in into um, building stateful applications um, in the serverless era. So how do we how do we start with that? Um, let, let's actually start with just building applications in the in the serverless era and and actually ignore stateful just for a second. So the um, the, the the core building block that um, that 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 comes up again and again in in pretty much um, all modern infrastructure is this. This unit of of an of an event driven function, and that that can be you know it can be a function that is deployed as an an event driven function in Knative. It can be an it can be the interface with which you program AWS Lambda or any of the other um, serverless function compute um, yeah platforms on on any of the other cloud providers. But it's also um, it's also a very a very common pattern outside of out of outside of those ecosystems. Um, this event-driven function is the core of, of most stream processing technology, be that in, in Flink, in Kafka. Um, it's also what, um, what is, in, in some sense, the unit of, um, uh, of, of actor programming. An actor is, is also, in some, in some sense, an, an event-driven function. So taking this as a starting point seems like a, a pretty good idea. 
um, when when starting to work on 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 something like you know stateful stateful serverless um, event driven applications. And there's there's some really nice properties. Like in its in its simplicity, it it gives us the ability to be really highly uh, elastic, um, scale out, um, scale in, scale to zero really fast. And and this characteristic is also what I think defined a lot of the success of um, of, of this abstraction. So this is, a, I think, so far, this has been um, in in the industry a pretty big success story when it comes. To building stateless applications, however, if we're trying to to build stateful applications, I think we're losing a lot of the of the niceness that um, that we are, that we have in, in in this technology. So, building stateful applications means now we're pulling in something like a database, and that's easily where where things start to um, I want to say fall apart. But where the let's say the smoothness of our our serverless application development. Um, yeah, stops and where where things become become rough, edgy. So all of a sudden, you know, we we have to really worry about how do we actually talk to to the database? Like, what what kind of protocol do we employ to to guarantee state consistency? Um, and it's it's not it doesn't just stop with um, saying sure I'm I'm going to use a database that supports transactions and so on. We still have to worry about um, about the different different instances. Um, Looking at at stale information or trying to aggregate different um, different data from different snapshots and so on, um, we see very often that while the while the stateless part um, is, is is infinitely scalable, infinitely, I mean, to as much as your cloud provider is willing to provide, um, very often the bottleneck isn't isn't actually in the in the stateless part. Itself in the lambda functions, the bottleneck starts to become the the um, access to data in the database. So you're you're making a, a request, takes a while to res um, to process and respond, and while you're you're scaling out the the functions to be able to handle more of these requests at the same time, it doesn't really help the application because the bottleneck isn't isn't the function itself. It's actually the database. It can actually make things even worse. So if um, if you're actually scaling the stateless part too much, because you see that a lot of the functions are starting to take a long time to execute, just because they're waiting for the database to process the requests, you're starting you're scaling this out more and more. You're hammering the database with even more requests, and all of a sudden you start to see like um, um, request limiting, or you see you see failures due to denied connections and so on. And um, well, well, all of this is is in some sense solvable with the right tricks and techniques. It's it's just something where the whole serverless experience is starting to to fall apart. It's it's something where you know state is just inherently not serverless in this in this situation. It's something you have to explicitly worry about, you have to manage, you have to think about there being a physical database with limited um, amount of connections, with uh, supported request rates and so on. So this is really um, part of the problem we're we're looking to solve here. Um, another another part where um, that's that's partly related to the stateful serverless space, but in general also a big limitation of the of the ecosystem of um, yeah of, of serverless applications is how do we actually compose more complex applications? So how do we go from the point of having individual functions that do one task to having you know more complex applications that in the general, in the general case, message each other or RPC each other to, you know, to to aggregate different information um, to compose a final response to the original request. And there are solutions like workflows of serverless functions, but all of these are like very special case, don't really don't really form much of a general solution yet. So so much for for the for the problem space. Um, what I'd like to introduce now is the is the work we've been doing in the in the stateful functions project and um like try to explain how we're how we're looking to address some of these um some of these issues that we see in applications there. And um once I've you know, once I've motivated this, there's a there's a demo towards the end um showing how you can can do a, a simple stateful serverless machine learning classifier system based on that. So the the core of, of the of the stateful functions project is I guess you you will have guessed it from the name is is the idea of building applications actually not with stateless functions but with stateful functions. So um like this this picture is somehow the like the 
the bird's eye view of um, of a stateful function application. Um, in the core, it consists of a lot of functions that that treat state as as um, yes, yeah, almost as local variables, like a, a property you would you'd find in you know having having just persistent local local variables in an, in a regular java program not not something that is you know a proxy towards a database and so on but really just constant time access to um to local state um that that gets rid of a lot of the of the problems of actually uh, dealing with state um there, there are multiple instances of these of these functions. You can think of them like in the same way as you have in, in actor programming. You would have multiple instances of these of these actors, and they um, they basically invoke each other. They send each other messages, um, take the responses, and and process them. And the um, the second part that is really um, a big deal that we um, that we paid attention to here is trying to trying to get a lot of the common problems of this interaction out of the way. So assuming that if you have one function that um, that messages another and is expecting a response from that function, you can actually assume that this reliably happens exactly once. Um, you, you can probably already see, like in the terminology and also in the kind of guarantees we're going to give you, this is, this is clearly coming a little bit from the direction of data stream processing, which is um, what we're working on um, in the Apache Flink project pretty much most of the time. So yeah, these these guarantees that that stateful function is here is trying to give you is, is in a very are very similar guarantees to what uh, modern stream processors do want to give you, namely consistent local state and the ability for for functions to talk with each other with exactly once guarantees. That means a message that you send is guaranteed to arrive and it's guaranteed to arrive once. If something happens on the way, the whole system will um, consistently undo certain changes both on the receiver and on the um, sender side to be able to, to retry it without duplicating any effects. And the whole thing is actually built to, to work without, without having to manage um, a database in the background. So um, state management that happens uh, in the function doesn't actually, in the, in the background, actually propagate to a database, but it's, it's asynchronously snapshotted to, um, to mass storage, something like S3, S3, or HDFS, or other, other um, mass distributed file systems. And yeah, the, the way you actually program this, um, in the newest version, um, we support both um, Java and Python, is, um, is very much, I, th I would say, akin to a very, to a very lightweight actor programming API. Um, this, is, this is a simple example in, um, in yeah, that, that takes a message. Um, Looks a little bit at you know what is what is the type of the message? How should I react to it? Is it a um, is it a vector that I should uh, compute a classification for, or is it a feedback with which I should update my model? And then you can actually you know if, if you look at the code below, it's not a hundred percent complete example, but it gives you a rough idea in how you just access state from the local context, um, do some actions, and send out a result message. So this is kind of from the the API perspective. The, the core of, um, of of the idea behind you know building building applications with stateful functions and um, I hope it kind of I hope it kind of explains how at least from the you know from the programming abstraction this kind of helps you to get rid of thinking about a database in the background because you're thinking just about functions with local variables of state and you don't have to worry about the composition of functions in in, in, in ways that are um, you know, we have to worry about fault tolerance and and failover because it it gives you the this kind of stream processing like exactly once guarantees across the communication of a lot of functions. Um, for those of you that have actually followed the stream processing and Apache Flink space a bit, they they will probably recognize that this is very reminiscent of a lot of stuff that is happening here. So what's really the the main difference? Um, there's a lot of difference in how it works in the in, in the background, um, which I'll, I'll come to in a bit. But also from the from the programming abstractions perspective, there are differences um, such as um, the um, yeah the the topology and stream processing is is usually a directed acyclic graph that you predefine. So um, if you if you build a stream processing application, you usually start with um, some data sources, and then you say, okay, I'm going to apply maybe a filter transformation here, a map transformation, and then I'm feeding this into the left side of a join, and then there's another stream I'm feeding into the right side of a join, and then I'm applying and let's say aggregation by a certain by a certain uh, grouping key or so as a last step. 
Um, in, in contrast to that, the idea of, um, of, of stateful functions is really to be, to be much more low level and flexible as, um, as you, as you kind of need it for a lot of applications. So you're not defining your, your data flow a priori. You, you're basically just deploying functions and they can dynamically at runtime decide who they talk to. They just send message to a logical address and they await a response from there. Um, they can communicate in patterns that include like cyclic messaging, which you cannot do in stream processing. And they have a very dynamic nature in, in how, they, um, how they are created and how they occupy resources. Versus stream processing more has like fixed pipelines that you know they can be scaled in and out, but at any point in time, they actually have a, a, a certain fixed set of resources. Um, as such, the, the idea behind stateful functions is actually much closer to something that I think it's been often called virtual stateful actors, um, but with very high consistency guarantees like consistent local state and exactly once messaging guarantees. So if you're coming from this space, if you're, um, if you're for example, an, an ACA programmer or so, you can think of stateful functions as a, a version that, um, that makes an opinionated choice in how, how these um, certain configurations should be chosen. For example, you don't have, co you don't have um, a, a super um, flexible system of like uh, supervision and um, deciding what you do if a, you know if, if an exception um, happens or so. But but rather the system makes an opinionated choice to say okay we're we're opting completely here for um, for strong consistency guarantees and um, we're for example um, not not remaining available under um, under a uh, at, under a network partition. So while you know with with actor systems like like Akka, they give you these very flexible primitives with uh, heart beating and and watching and um, and supervision. And you can, for example, also build uh, AP systems and so on. Stateful functions is really an opinionated choice towards a CP system that is um, in that way actually making the APIs quite a bit simpler. So from the API perspective. Um, that is um, pretty much it. One one big part that um, that is, is the question now: How do we actually handle handle state the serverless way? Because we kind of touched only on yeah, sure, we don't want to have this. We don't want to have a database in the background. We don't want to um, yeah be forced to um, to deal with connections and so on. We just want to pretend that we have persistent local state, and then there's some snapshots in the background. So I, I admit there was a bit hand wavy in the first and part first part, but it was. I was so on purpose just to focus on the um, on the aspect of like what what is the API towards the user what what abstraction can can the user um, expect here and the second part I'd I'd like to dive a bit into how does actually this um, how does it actually work underneath the hood how do how does the system give these um, consistency guarantees and still actually maintain the uh, this nice um, serverless elasticity without sacrificing anything on the stateful side. So if you if you look at the at the literature for this, there's actually quite a bit of uh, work and also research on the area on how do you actually add consistent state to serverless systems. And there, there are quite a few approaches that that center around around something like this, where you have um, you have your compute layer, um, basically something like AWS Lambda, just very fast, elastically scalable stateless functions, and then you have a layer that is um, responsible for basically presenting the state of that layer. There's databases in the background, but this middle layer kind of through crashing and proxying is trying to abstract that away for you, from you. That's actually explicitly not what we've been trying to do here. It's it's a possible approach, but it um, it is something that we, we took a bit of a look at initially, and um, it's, it's very complicated um, in the end to do it um, correctly and efficiently. And there's actually a, a, there's a, a slight trick I think you can do to um, to, to still gain um, a lot of the benefits, but um, yeah, with with a with with much um, with a much simpler approach in the end. And to to kind of motivate that, maybe um, let's 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 do a quick like um, a thought experiment on um, on challenges and approaches to to um, to consistency in, in in these distributed applications. So let's assume here we have um, we have three different different applications like you know types of functions that talk to some some database DynamoDB, Cassandra, HBase, Elastic or so in the background. Um, and yeah, the, these let's let's assume they form um, something like a microservice each. And 
um, an, an interaction with the application. It starts um, with the API gateway and one of the functions, and then these functions also have to talk to other functions to, to in the end, do their work, to you know, request data from other services, update data on other services. Okay. Um, the the first um, first thing that happens is that there is a, a request to the first service. It looks at the um, at the database. It, um, and updates uh, something, and then it sends a message to the second service, um, which in turn also uh, updates something in the database. Now, let's assume in this case here we have a um, we have a failure, and we didn't get a response from the second service back to the to the first service. So the second function actually didn't didn't tell the first function, okay, you know. Everything, everything went through. Now we're in a bit of a tricky situation because we don't quite know: did it go through? Did it not go through? Do I have to like retry it, or will it will it result in a duplicate? Um, did it actually go go through and not just miss the acknowledgement? Or, or yeah, just it's it's this general problem, um, two generals problem, that that is hard to solve in distributed systems. And there's there's lots of work in in applications and protocols and so on try to work around it, but it it's it's always an issue you have to worry about in in one or the other way. Now, one thing we can try and do is we can just try to reverse a little bit the, the role between the application and um, the database here. So let's assume just for a second that, you know, instead of the API gateway actually talking to Lambda here and um, sending, sending the request there and then Lambda talking to the database, it would actually first um, send it to the database and then the database would, um, you know, like recorded, associated probably with um, some some entity that um, that it belongs to, let's say user ID or so, and then from there call call a function, get the request back, and then talk to uh, send it back to the database for the for the next service, which in turn would also you know invoke invoke the function. If we actually have the problem now that we that we see a failure in that in the transmission, we're in, in a much easier um, place actually. Um, we're in a much better place to solve this problem because on on the on the database layer we're handling both the state now and the messaging and once we do that there we can actually employ a lot of like very very known proven protocols in a, in a very generic way to actually make sure that the updates to to state and and messaging that this happens in like in an anatomic way that does not cause loss or duplicates and we sort of have a way to make all our um all our invocations to to lambda functions pretty much yeah stateless item item potent um, so if we actually have to call this function again it actually doesn't matter because that function does no longer make a decision about sending a message or about triggering an update all these decisions are now just generically made down inside the database system so in some sense what what we're what we're what we really need to employ this trick is is kind of yeah, this inversion about applica how applications and data interact. So rather than having an application that takes a request, talks to the database and gives a response, we actually have something like, I actually see it on the slide already, something like a stream processor that takes this stream of requests and then calls our applications and, and gives a stream of, of responses. And if we do this the right way, then we can, yeah, we can just keep using applications um, in the, or building them in the exact same way as before. And we just swap the database with the stream processor, and we're, we can pretty much can pretty much go. And um, we've we've gained a very a very nice way of, of building stateful um, stateful systems here. Um, it also means that we're we're really switching a little bit the the roles of of who is actually in charge of you know driving the entire application. In the in the classical sense, it's the application it, rec it retrieves the request, and it's in charge of you know making requests and responses to the database, and the database pretty much reacts to those. And on the right-hand side, we have the stream processor deciding when it's, the right, um, when it's the right moment to actually invoke the application with a certain piece of, um, piece of computation that we need to do. So applying this maybe to, um, to something, like, you know, something like the AWS stack, if you're familiar with this, it would actually mean that instead of um, Let's say we're we're building an application that that uh, processes data from um, from Kinesis, which is a, like a, a streaming message queue, queue here. Um, rather than than building it in in the way that you would find it on on the Amazon block, yeah, like define your Lambda functions to consume data from Kinesis and then work around DynamoDB, we'd actually we'd actually say like the first consumer for, uh, of these events 
is actually the stream processor, and then the stream processor talks to the API gateway to the Lambda functions. And it's it's actually worth noting that we kind of solved two of the most cited problems of of the whole um, the whole serverless um, space with that, like uh, consistent scalable state and messaging and composition. Um, for the sake of time, because we started a little late, um, I'm going to skip over the um, over the recap of of Apache Flink here. Um, just mentioning really quick, Apache Flink is this stream processing system that, um, that we're working on. It's kind of the umbrella project of, of stateful functions. And the, um, in, in its core, it's really an engine that, that pushes streams through operations and in the background um, takes uh, consistent asynchronous snapshots of the streaming pipeline in order to recover them. And it has these interesting properties of being able to give you exactly once guarantees for your state and your messaging without actually needing a ton of coordination overhead. Um, if you haven't actually looked at, 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 at Apache Flink at all so far, I, I can hardly recommend it. Take, take a look. It's a really interesting project. I'm, I might be a biased person, but I, I, I do honestly believe that. Um, so back to back to stateful functions um, itself. So as I mentioned, this um, this is built on on stream processing technology. In this case, specifically on Apache Flink. If you actually de deploy, um, if you actually use it in production, what you what you actually see is that in the core you deploy you deploy a yeah a, a cluster of Flink with stateful functions, pretty much like you would otherwise deploy a database, and you basically um, you basically register modules, ingress modules or so that say, okay, here are the events that um, that you dis that you consume, that you um, that you react to, and then you can actually register certain modules of functions that may result on um, as a separate kid, um, Kubernetes deployments or um, may result behind an API gateway um, if if you're talking about you know serverless functions to to actually um, execute execute the logic and um, yeah, let me actually quickly quickly show you what um, what this looks like um, if you actually use it in um, for real application. So the the use case that I've picked is actually a um, is actually a machine learning application um, which is taking a, a stream of user events and um, is is outputting um, like a, a fraud risk score for that. So the the way that this application works is that every event first runs through a set of statistical um, statistical functions that collect certain aggregates, like what is the time since you know the, that user did another transaction, what is the what is the the number of times they have used it for this sort of um, for this sort of uh, yeah product, or how many times have they used it in that country, and so on. So think of it as yeah as different aggregates of of, of such of such features. And then we pass it actually through a classifier module. So the classifier um, is is a is a as a Python um, a simple Python machine learning um, algorithm, um, which which uses five different which actually uses uh, five different algorithms here, um, to that represent different ways of of classifying the fraud. And the idea here is it it depends on what kind of persona the user is, which model actually gives the the most accurate um, accurate prediction whether this is a fraud or not. So some somebody who is you know mainly an online shopper, mainly an offline shopper, somebody that travels a lot, travels travels little. Um, it's actually um, it's quite a popular model to have this um, to have this multiple different models and then try to to pick the one that is most accurate for the user. And an approach to do this is this uh, multi-armed uh, bandit or or k-bandits where you where you're emulating these um, you know like this. Um, bandit slot machines, and you're actually saying the one that gives me the highest reward. That's that's the the one that decides for for the model that I pick. So this is also a stateful thing because we need to remember how many times did we pick um, individual uh, individual models and what was the what was the accuracy, what was the reward we got in the end for this model. Um, if we implement this and this um, in this stateful functions approach, what we what we have to do on the let's say on the on the Flink side on the event-driven database side is we have to register an ingress model for um, for the different um, type of requests that come in. In this case, it's it's requests. Um, here, the type URL is is a demo sparse vector that is um, a vector that we want to get classified, and then prediction feedback, which is you know once we know it, was it actually a fraud or not, um, in hindsight, a feedback to the model. And then on the right hand side, this is basically all it takes in order to say let's um, let's define let's register a function model um, a function module to be invoked here. 
And then this is the same um, the same code I showed earlier. Um, this is pretty much what it looks like to implement such a function. It's pretty it's pretty compact code in the end. So let's actually um, let's actually take two minutes and just see how how this looks like if we if we run this. Have to quickly see how do we do this with the presentation here. Okay. Does this work? Okay. I just hit play. It's a pre-recorded demo for um, for the sake of being easy to broadcast here. Okay. Um, so uh, the the application that we're seeing here is outputting or is visualizing on the right hand side um, our our average fraud score, and we can we can probably see that something is something's off here a little bit because you know. 0.8 of every transaction being fraudulent, they were probably misclassifying something here. So over time of this demo, we want to repair this. Let's look quickly at um, at what, what we have here running. And um, this is really a, a, an absolute standard um, Kubernetes deployment as you would actually deploy, you know, um, let's say a database on Kubernetes and an application. Now the interesting part is because Flink works with this asynchronous snapshots in the background to something like, in this case, um, we're running this on Google Cloud, so Google Cloud Storage, we actually don't even need stateful sets here. So we're actually running state less processes here for the master and the worker. And then a few, the um, you see they're called Python workers here in the in the entry um, for, for the actual um, for the actual functions. So and we can we can actually you know now um, scale these um, these stateless workers in the in the exact same way as we would scale any other um, any other application. Um, if we would run this, for example, on on AWS, we would actually see that you know it would actually scale automatically depend, depending on the request rate. Or we could just add in this Kubernetes example here an auto scaling group to scale it for us. On this demo, we scale it manually though. Um, another thing that we can can pretty easily do here is just um, swap the the container um, image for the functions in order to, for example, apply a new version of the software that has um, that has a patch um, that that fixes the the classification. For example, we can see that I don't know cannot see this well here because the screen is cut off at the bottom. Ah, now we can see it better. Yeah. And um, so this repairs um, this repairs our deployment. What is interesting to see here is that in, in the course of this entire um, deployment, we actually did not get any any disruption of the um, of the system, and we didn't actually have to do anything in our code to worry about okay, well, how do we deal with certain old versions of the code running, certain new versions of the code running? How do we deal with um, yeah, how do we deal with um, concurrent access to um, to certain entries and so on? So all of this is pretty much solved by the system out of the box. All right, and with that, I'm pretty much at the end of this talk. Um, yeah, the, um, that's it, that's what we're, um, that we're, what we're currently developing. Um, see, it's the, in a nutshell, it's, a, it's really an, a, a system that, that tries to, to give you this, um, this stateful serverless programming abstraction um, Akin to you know stateful actors um, working with a stream processor in the background, and yeah, it's an it's a fairly new project. It's open for contribution if if you're um, if you're interested um, in it. And with that, I'd like to conclude the talk. Thank you very much. So just imagine a virtual room full of people clapping, and they're out there clapping. So thank you for your talk. Um, nice we don't have any questions in the Slack channel right now. Uh, I would remind people to join the breakout mm -hmm. group, great breakout room in Jitsi, uh, which you will be in after this. Um, I have one really quick question because we're really yeah. out of time. What do you think are the ideal use cases? For so this, compared to, compared yeah. to wh what you showed and what other people might yeah. uh, use, what do you find is like the real... Yeah. Um, let me try and give a, give a very short answer to this. There's <laughs> there's a lot to it. I think actually uh, something like I showed in this demo, like distributed, um, like doing distributed feature vectors um, for for machine learning classifiers is actually a very a very good fit for this type of applications. Another one is actually um, 
like maintaining distributed um, statistics and aggregates for um, for um, IoT or so use cases where you have lots of decentralized sensors and what you want to keep is um, an overview of you know what are the individual um, what, what is happening in certain areas in certain regions and you have for example the sensors have spiky loads so you're really interested in this uh, um, very elastic system. Um, we've actually played around with a bunch of use cases. We've actually even like prototyped a small um, like gaming backend for for a browser game and this and so on. So there's there's tons of stuff you can do. Yeah, um, I think we're only beginning to really understand what you can do with this. I would say in the long run, the goal of this project is try to make pretty much everything that that you currently set up your own web server yeah. style application for make it possible to build something like that on this abstraction. All right, but there's a way to go. Look forward to it. All right, thanks again.